Hi everyone, thanks for watching this presentation. This is a preview of my Black Hat presentation that I will give next week at the Arsenal in London. And uh, I'm going to be talking about RF Quack, which is a framework that um, I and uh, some of my, uh, let's say, community members have um, helped me build. Um, and uh, it turned out to be useful for a variety of things. You can use it for supporting your um, reverse engineering of radio transmissions, such as IoT devices, or you can use it for um, training, or you can use it for developing other systems. So let's, let's dig into it. It's been a while since I don't talk about RF Quack. Um, this is how it started. So as you can see, a very uh, primitive, uh, like sort of a hack together um, boards and uh, lots of um, uh, wires. So it turned out to be really a prototype like many of the, of the systems out there. Um, and um, this is how I can probably say um, the status looks like. We have uh, fairly good documentation. We have maintainable source code. Um, we have um, a modular system for making new boards and so on. So I'm pretty happy about the current status. Um, before I begin, I would like to uh, thank a few people. Uh, I would like to start with my uh, previous employer, Trend Micro Research, who welcomed my proposal to open source a POC that um, I used during a project in 2019 and uh, that POC uh, over time evolved into the first version of uh, RF Quack which uh, has been released at uh, Hack in the Box Armory 2019 and then evolved into what it is now. Um, I also want to thank the students who were very passionate um, working on this project and uh, especially Andrea Guglielmini, who made an amazing work restructuring the firmware and making it nice and modular. And finally, um, I want to thank the small but very um, passionate community that is slowly growing um, and is keeping me motivated and uh, also provide some early testing, which is uh, very important in small open source projects like this one. Um, let's have a look at uh, very quickly at the agenda for today. Um, I'm going to be starting with uh, very quickly um, RF analysis 101, which means I'm going to tell you the basics of how to reverse engineer uh, digital radios. Then I'm going to jump into a first demonstration to show um, what RF Quack can do without explaining too much uh, how. And uh, then we'll dig into um, differences between RF Quack and uh, other approaches. And um, I will give you another demo. And then we will go deeper into the internals of RF Quack so that you can understand better how it works. And uh, uh, if you want, uh, it should be relatively easy to customize the firmware if you ever want to. Uh, most of the time, you don't need to, um, to modify any code. That's the purpose of RF Quack to change how the, um, how the hardware looks like. Sorry, uh, how the hardware behaves. And then uh, we'll conclude going uh, a little beyond uh, RF, uh, a little beyond radio frequency analysis, um, because I think that uh, RF Quack uh, offers a fairly generic interface to um, spy radios. So I think it's also a handy tool to poke with um, spy registers and uh, hopefully see how the how the radio uh, reacts. And then we'll conclude with some resources and uh, community um, links to the community, sorry. And um, I'm gonna announce uh, a little uh, hardware prize that uh, I will give out to the, to the first contributor of uh, one specific feature that I really like to, to see implemented. Great, so uh, let's get started with uh, some uh, radio frequency analysis one-on-one. -on -one. I hope um, and uh, I promise this won't take more than five minutes. Usually when <clears throat> you have a signal um, that you want to analyze, let's say a remote controller or a keyless uh, door entry or 
uh, your uh, garage controller or any other IoT device in general, uh, you go through at least three fundamental uh, steps. First, you need to do some recon of the signal. You want to understand where the frequency is, where the carrier or the frequency is, where, what's the bandwidth. Um, and then you need to find uh, precise radio parameters, which means what kind of modulation it's using. We're talking about uh, digital radio, so there has to be a way to, to, to um, translate um, analog waveforms into digital symbols. Um, then um, the shape of the modulation and uh, usually the symbol rate, which is how many uh, bits per second uh, or symbols per second we see. And finally, and uh, this is a step that is very important if you want to weaponize um, a vulnerability or if you want to POC or do some red teaming exercises, uh, you need to develop a reliable transceiver. Usually you embed this into software or into hardware some ways. Um, so every, usually every, uh, every penetration testing is um, a thing on its own. So the first step is uh, once you have identified a carrier, um, you need to translate um, from symbols to signals or vice versa. So normally when you want to transmit, let's see, let's say 10010, uh, and you want to do this with uh, a waveform, then you need to change the characteristics of the, of the waveform to encode the symbols. So one way is to use amplitude shift uh, keying or amplitude shift modulation, by which you change the shape, sorry, you change the um, amplitude of the waveform of the carrier, essentially, uh, and uh, you encode symbols with different amplitudes. Another way is to change the frequency. As you can see here, there are um, two distinct frequencies. At the beginning, there is a slightly higher frequency, and then we switch to a lower frequency, then high again, and then low again. And here we can encode symbols with different frequencies. Or you can change the phase. Um, here you see that um, up, up until S1, symbol one, uh, we see a certain phase. And then when there's symbol zero, we see uh, the, uh, the opposite phase. So we switch it. And then again, symbol one, symbol zero. And uh, as, a, as an example, this is how a frequency uh, shift keying uh, looks like, FSK. You can clearly see that there are the zeros and the one. Um, once you apply the threshold there, uh, you see you can decide which symbols are, I mean, which part, which frequency encodes the ones and which frequency encodes the zero. And then after this, um, the, <clears throat> the modem can do other, other more sophisticated things, such as um, packing more symbols, more bits to encode uh, different symbols or assigning different symbols to, the al to, to a different alphabet. It really depends on uh, how the uh, modem is engineered. Uh, now we have the bit stream. So we have the, the series of bits and uh, we have to turn them into symbols. And this is uh, hard enough, as you can see, um, but this is just the beginning. Because then what you want is to, you want more semantic. You want to be able to understand what part of the, um, um, what part of the bitstream is just a preamble that's needed to um, synchronize the, the transceiver, and then what part is a sync, so-called sync words, so such as an, uh, uh, an initial addressing, and then what part is the juicy, the juicy payload, and then there might be some trailers. And um, then, you, if you can, if you keep digging, um, you will understand that this is just the envelope for another application protocol. Uh, that normally in IoT devices in the sub gigahertz um, spectrum have some custom application protocol. Sometimes there is some security through obscurity baked in, uh, or some rolling code or other pre preliminary, not preliminary, but primitive, let's say, uh, sort of a cryptography systems that are used to uh, hide information, usually not very well. Uh, but yeah, this is how, how things work usually. And usually what you want is understand how the, the structure of the payload looks like. 
And to do this, you have different approaches. So let's compare them so we understand better how uh, RF Quack is positioned. We have classic approach, um, software defined radios. These are essentially um, oscilloscopes with uh, antennas and um, an amplifier. So essentially the antenna will pick up a signal and then you take snapshots at very high frequency. So this is the analog waveform as you can see here. And each of these uh, crosses is um, a sample that has been uh, taken usually with an onboard FPGA. So we can uh, sample a very high frequency or sample rate actually. <clears throat> and then we transfer these symbols as numbers into, uh, into a file and uh, we can do whatever we want. So what we have is a very precise reconstruction of a waveform. Normally what you do is you use some software and here's an example, um, Universal Radio Hacker that allows you to find the frequency. Here we have a transmitter at uh, 434 megahertz. And then um, once you have identified the carrier, you switch to the uh, demodulated signal. Here we have already understood that uh, it's FSK and we can see it if we zoom in we see that there, there are distinct frequencies in here and uh, here is a, a preamble you measure the length of the preamble um, you know that uh, you have um, in 3.13 uh, milliseconds you have uh, collected um, this amount of samples these are the samples uh, I mean these samples right so you can um, you can then measure the length in number of samples uh, of each of these, which is one bit so this is a one this is a zero again a one and so on so you have you can set the number of samples per symbol and so you can reconstruct the symbol rate so um, if we take a look at uh, this approach uh, from um, along this dimension we see that um, software defined radios, whether you use GNU Radio or a Universal Radio Hacker or whatever other software is out there, uh, what you have is a very wide spectrum coverage. Um, you can basically cover any, um, any range that you want. The uh, RF parameters flexibility is really 100% um, flexible in the sense that you can create your custom physical layer. That's exactly what you're doing. I mean, when you create a, a GNU radio flow graph, you are creating a, a physical layer implementation. Uh, host interfaces, usually they are high speed USB, like USB 3 um, or Ethernet in the older versions. Mm, there is a, a really high, um, there's a really high how can I say, um, uniformity in the API in the sense that um, these are very well established projects. Uh, all of the uh, software take as input uh, IQ samples, so it's, it's very standardized. Uh, GNU Radio is very extensible and uh, as well as URH, so there is a very good flexibility here. Um, and the main targets that you have in mind when you use an SDR to analyze uh, RF protocols are the physical layer and um, especially if you use GNU radio, whereas software like URH will, um, will, will help you more focus on the logic layer, which means on the uh, interpretation. Um, the focus is um, on the research. I mean, you can really do everything with an SDR, um, but I would say that the transceiver, the resulting transceiver performance, unless you implement it into an FPGA, it's, uh, it's going to be uh, fairly, um, fairly low in the sense that uh, everything happens really in software. Uh, harder cost, you can pick up an SDR for 20 bucks on Amazon, or you can buy a professional one for several hundreds of, several thousands uh, dollars. On the completely opposite, on the completely opposite side of the spectrum, we have um, dongles, RF hacking dongles, and uh, here we have really. I just put three: uh, the Yardstick one, um, and I think this is a another uh, CC01 dongle, and here is uh, we have the famous Panda Wharf, which is also CC1101 based, and um, there are tens of them. 
Um, usually what they offer is um, a some sort of Python interface where you can interact with the dongle through some, some custom protocol. Um, so you can set the frequency, set the modulation, the packet length, uh, and then you can transmit, receive, and so on. So from, from this viewpoint, they are on the completely opposite side. So instead of having a continuous spectrum coverage, we only cover very specific band, depending on the little transceiver that you mount on, on these dongles. Um, the, the parameters, uh, the RF parameters are bound also to the hardware, in the sense that if you take, for example, the CC1101, it will allow you to, uh, to tune at uh, 300, 400, uh, 800, 900 megahertz, and that's it. Uh, if you want other bands, you have to have another transceiver. Um, interfaces are very uh, different. They can be USB, Bluetooth, and so on. The uniformity, uniformity of the API is very low. I said that every, every dongle firmware has their own API, and that's really true. Uh, there is uh, normally not much documentation, not much focus on the API. There's more focus on uh, the functionalities. Um, and uh, the extensibility is very low um, in the sense that, uh, yes, you have to write firmware extensions or you have to change the firmware completely if you want to, to do something more customized. And uh, the target uh, is normally just uh, the logic layer, so from the packet uh, structure upwards, essentially. And uh, these devices are normally focused for uh, red teaming um development effort um it is quite uh, low in the sense that uh, if you're happy with scripting you can just script up some python and you're good to go uh some like the uh, multi-radio ones have um, a slightly better user interface because they are more modern they, they came after let's say the yarn stick one um but if you need to dig deeper and change the firmware, well, there's no other way you have to change the firmware. The good thing is that uh, <clears throat> the precision and the, the, the performance of the transceiver are very high because the radio is implemented in hardware. So you get predictable uh, performance, uniform and repeatable experiments. And they cost uh, very little. Um, let's switch to a first demonstration uh, because I want to show you that from, from the surface uh, RF quite doesn't appear uh, different from uh, other uh, dongles such as the, the RF Quack, uh, sorry, RF Cat uh, ones which are CC1101 based. So let me switch to the, the uh, terminal. What we have here, actually let me show you also the um, camera. So what we have here is a dongle, uh, RF Quack dongle with uh, two radios and the main board here. So I'm going to go ahead and connect it to the USB. And now I'm going to um, connect to it through the serial port. And here we go. So we have a little welcome screen like... Um, in other dongles, you have like a um, welcome screen with a um, nice dock welcoming you and uh, some, some example uh, functionalities that um, you can invoke or play around with uh, and the link to the documentation. So uh, I'm going also to plug a, um, a node here that I'm going to use throughout the demos. This node is uh, just a very dumb node that I made uh, that uh, spits out messages at the given frequency. So I'm going to put it right here so it doesn't get into the screen. All right, so um, what I'm going I'm to do here on the right-hand side is to uh, connect to the um, interface of the uh, emitting node. We'll see that uh, this node is uh, simply emitting data. Let me reset it. Okay, so it's blinking. Okay, I don't like the random. It generates random messages, but sometimes the randomization is not nice. Okay, so now we see that um, it's transmitting at uh, 434 megahertz, and it's transmitting this message. And every time I reboot it, it, it will transmit a, a different message. Good. 
So uh, now let's leave it. Let's leave it there. Um, our quack is on the left. So uh, I'm going to um, ask RF quack to uh, set the modem, um, set the modem on the second radio at 434. And uh, I'm going to use the default parameters. I know them because I coded, I coded the, the dongle, but sorry, I coded the uh, signal generator. So, but this is just an experiment to, to show the uh, surface, let's say, of RF Quack in terms of uh, functionalities. All right, so now uh, the radio is in um, set like this. I'm gonna put it in receiver mode, and here I see the messages arriving. You might see that they don't come completely uh, in sync for different reasons. The reason is that, uh, well, radios are not uh, perfect. Some messages might get missed for physical reasons. Other reasons is that for demo purposes, I compiled uh, RF Quack with uh, full logging capabilities. And the login also happens through the serial port. So if you, for example, switch to debug, uh, you will also see that the login messages coming from here. You see the login messages coming on this on the serial protocol. So it's not optimal in terms of performance, uh, but um, for this demo, I'm, I left it. I left it like this. All right. So let's switch back now to the um, to the slides. I don't want to focus too much now on uh, what happened and how it happened. I want to continue and show you a little bit uh, um, how we can um, compare RF Quack with other other systems. I think that the most important thing that I want to highlight is that um, differently from radio dongles such as RF cat based ones uh, that cover only specific bands uh, RF quack allows you to still stay on the discrete space so we're not having like in SDR a continuous spectrum coverage uh, but the bands are arbitrary in the sense that if I if I'm not happy with uh, one transceiver and we will see later I can swap out the transceiver and put another transceiver in. I'm going to show you real quick uh, here. If I'm not happy with, uh, let's say, this transceiver, I can swap it out very easily and then change it as I want. So um, this is one, uh, I mean, key factor that distinguish, uh, distinguishes RF Quack um, with respect to all the other dongles, because all the other dongles are fixed in terms of hardware. The hardware is soldered on a board and uh, you cannot change anything. You cannot change the MCU, you cannot change uh, the radios. Um, and this comes, I mean, this, this creates a much uh, different settings in the sense that um, having a modular hardware as well as a modular software, you can create the radios that you want with ease. And that's exactly the point of RF Quack. Uh, focusing on uh, the API, making an API, a uniform API that other people can develop on top of, and then um, let people customize on the firmware or on the uh, receiving side on the on the console as much as possible. So we are in this um, in this space. We're closer to uh, an SDR. Um, we allow more, more flexibility and um, uh, we also have a um, much lower uh, development effort because we focused a lot in the initial phases at creating a, a sort of standardized API or a protocol that makes it easy to extend. And we get the same performance of a uh, single or multi-radio dongle in the sense that we don't have to implement anything in software ever so well it's of course it's software but the radio is is in hardware and uh, only what comes out of the radio um, is implemented in software so what you do after you have decoded the packets is up to you in software but the decoding 
is uh, predictable, very precise, pretty much like in a single radio or multi-radio dongle, not like an SDR, which, uh, which precision really depends on how good you are at using GNU radio and uh, URH. Good. <clears throat> so now that you have seen that um, everything can be customized uh, in an easy way, I want to show you how. So let's say that you want, um, we want to make one radio, uh, one radio dongle. I already showed you this. We can take a doubler. Um, everything here is based on the, uh, well, actually I realized that this is not just a transceiver. This is a transceiver plus the MCU. So uh, let's let's forget about this little package here. So uh, let me open the camera so you can see exactly um, what I have here. Um, great. So this is a little. You will notice that this is a little different than what's shown on the slide because there's no uh, microcontroller here. This is only the radio. So in case I want to make one radio uh, dongle, that's all I need to do. So. I have some, I have an MCU. In this case, we've chosen a uh, ESP32. Uh, this is a Adafruit feather based uh, system with a very nicely, uh, uh, very nice form factor, very compact. And they come with these triplers or doublers, depending on what you want to use and how many radius you want to connect. Uh, you snap them together and then you have this one radio one MCU, that's all. You connect it to the serial port and that's what you have. How do you build it? How do you build a firmware? Well, you download um, RF Quark source code, you specify that you have one radio and the type of the radio is RF69 in this case. Um, you specify the connections, so uh, the chip select is on, on pin 13, Our, uh, IRQ is on pin 27 and then you can also add um, a uh, reset pin. In this case, the reset pin is connected to pin D and pin D is here, which is something like 26, I think, or 32, don't remember. Then you can enable the log and then all you have to do really, I'm not kidding, you do make flash and that's it. I'm gonna show you now um, how, how it works. So um, I'm connecting this. Let me switch to the terminal real quick. So here I have a single radio. So let's change it a little bit. Let me switch to the terminal because I realize that you're not seeing anything. Okay, good. Um, so let me comment out this. Well, actually I could remove them. That's okay. Let me also remove the models, the, the modules here. We don't need them. Okay, and then I make flash. I'm going to disconnect the second node because it's also on the serial and I don't want it to confuse. Oh yeah, of course, I need to activate the, um, Python virtual environment. Sorry. I could have used the existing one. Anyways, system is being very slow. There we go. It's not picking up the environment. That's weird. Let's try again. Okay. Let's see if the command is there. It's being very slow because I'm... Um, oh, there we go. I think we've got it now. Yeah, I should, I should upgrade pip. That's okay. OK, 
Okay, here we see some warnings because we're using so-called God mode in Radiolib, which is the underlying radio uh, abstraction layer. So it's giving us a warning that uh, we are really seeing everything. We're using full mode to control the radio, which is exactly what we want. And um, let's see. Good. It's amazing how, how much CPU time OBS is consuming. This is taking like 10 times longer than it usually takes. All right, so good. Now we have a fresh dongle that we can connect to here. Let's close our previous console and uh, let's connect to it. Good. Now you'll see that uh, we only have radio A because yeah, that's what we have. And a uh, little nugget, you get um, on, um, inline help and uh, I'm going to give you a hint on how this is can be generated. This is generated automatically. I'm going to give you this uh, hint on how it, I mean, it's not really a hint. I'm going to put this into your, into your ear so you can get distracted and think about how this is achieved without touching a line of Python. So hopefully by the end of the presentation, I will be have time to I'll have time to reveal. Good, so let's switch back to the slides. Um, and uh, of course you say, now I want two radios. And uh, yeah, I still have to fix this slide because this is not exactly matching the, the reality. Uh, well, that's okay, you've seen it already, right? You just add another radio, you change the um, build, environment firm, build environment configuration file, and then you make flash, and then you have two radios. And um, now <clears throat> I don't want to you know, take time again to compile it. So what I'm doing now is while I speak, I'm going to create another uh, firmware. I mean, I'm going to recreate another firmware with uh, two radios. So you can see that the console will automatically recognize um, two radios. So what I'm doing under, under the slides here is to, I'm compiling again another another uh, firmware while I talk and then when it's ready I can go back and show you but then you say I want different radios okay fine um, you can just take another uh, another radio you want uh, um, a 2.4 gigahertz radio that's fine let me show you here <clears throat> I'm going to switch to the camera now only full camera I have a nice box with everything in here. I have, um, this is a, another 433 megahertz receiver, same form factor, 2.4 receiver, same form factor, this is, yes, the same. And here we have a LoRa receiver, 900 megahertz and here we have a uh, fsk receiver um, 900 megahertz and then you can also say well but i want to change the mcu yeah that's great let's change the mcu you can have a teensy if you want so you see this is completely modular and uh, you don't have to stick to whatever the board exposes to you and if you ever want to create um, or adapt other radios, here. Um, I made adapters for, this is for the CC1120. On, on, on this side is, the pins are exactly matching the um, feather system by Adafruit. Here I have the adapter for the um, NRF 24L01 and here I have a slightly improved version with uh, um, 
say um, flexible jumper settings for the CC1101 and you can make as many as you want. It's fairly easy to, to make this with KiCad. Good, so let's switch back to the slides. Oh, it's finished. Now we have, let me switch back here. Good, so now I'm going to reconnect. Let me just power cycle it. Okay, good, so now I want to show you that here we have radio A as well as radio B. So you can put radio A as say in transmission mode and you can put radio, radio B in receiver mode and you can change according to what you want to have. Good, and uh, if you want you can change this radio to something else, NRF24, and it all the rest remains the same. Of course, you have to change the pins according to your wiring, but that's really all you have to do. Good, so let's go back to the slides so we can continue. So now you may wonder, uh, show me how all of this uh, happens internally. So yes, I want to show you the life of a packet from the air all the way to the console into your Python objects. So. On the left-hand side, we, we've understood that we have a modular hardware system. Um, <clears throat> we have a, a spy a shared spy bus. And uh, each module has a dedicated um, chip select wire and a dedicated um, interrupt wire. Some radios have two interrupts. At least most of the radios have at least two interrupts. So you can, you can have a second interrupt pin and some radios have a reset pin. So um, through the variables that I showed you earlier uh, in the terminal, um, you can uh, assign all of this by just changing a configuration file. So what we have is a modular uh, hardware dongle system with an MCU um, and one, two or more um, RF dongles, sorry, uh, RF uh, front ends. What really is the limit is the number of distinct CS and RQ wires because the SPI bus is shared by design and uh, it is accessible through uh, enabling and disabling the chip select uh, of this specific uh, RF module. So if we had, uh, let's say, a main board with, uh, let's say, 10 distinct CS and 10 distinct IRQ with no conflicts and so on, we could have up to 10 radios. So far we have up to five radios, um, but you know, uh, we can add more, no problem. Uh, the RF abstraction part is taken care of by uh, Radiolib. Radiolib is a very fine and maintained uh, Arduino abstraction layer for radios. It supports most of the radios. We have contributed one radio, the CC1101, which wasn't there. Um, it exposes um, quite uniform uh, API. Um, so each radio has its own radio driver into Radiolib. Um, and then we have developed a little adapter on top of each of them to make it even more uniform because some radios uh, have different methods, they take different parameters. We try to um, uniform a little bit and uh, whenever we find something that is worth pushing and contributing back to Radiolib, we try to do it. So what we expose to the user is, um, to, the, to the actual firmware is what we call a radio proxy, which is an, an abstra a uniform abstraction over all the radios. And then we have a series of, uh, of modules, but I'm going to skip them. Uh, we'll, I'll come to, to that later. And um, I think what's the, 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 the coolest part of this project is the protobuf pro base protocol. Um, we can communicate via cable. We can communicate via MQTT. We have implemented both of the transports, so you can go via network or via serial cable. You can even go by cellular if uh, your MCU has a cellular modem on top. Uh, but really, we think that uh, it's not really important uh, what the medium is. What's really important 
if you want to make something flexible is to agree on a protocol. And uh, we thought that uh, the most, let's say, embedded friendly way to create a protocol is to use protobuf because it supports most of the high level types um, and allows you, sorry, uh, uh, native C types. And then it allows you to create arbitrarily cast, customized uh, types. And on top of that, we have uh, serializers and deserializers um, on each side. So we receive protobuf, we decode, uh, we do stuff in, in, our, uh, in our IPython environment. Um, so here, uh, and, and as an example, whenever we receive a packet from the radio, we don't blindly stream it as is over serial, but we encode it as a, a protobuf a message as a, we call this a packet. So there is the actual data, which uh, also has a length. Uh, we know which radio we received it from. Uh, we know when we received it. We, we know how many times we, we repeat it. Um, we know the bit rate, carry frequency, sync words, modulation type. So this is the modem configuration, essentially. Good, and then once you have this, then you can build whatever you want. Once you have a uniform interface, um, you can do recon uh, by sweeping over frequencies. Um, you can do post-processing of received and transmitted protocols. Uh, you can do protocol fuzzing. You can do sniffing, user level scripting. You can really do a lot of things once you have an interface. We focused a lot on the interface as opposed to focusing on making the, the, the IPython client complex or exposing fancy methods. I think those can be built later. So I, I talked briefly about modules, but I didn't told, told you I didn't tell you what modules are. Modules are um, what allows um, to overcome some limitations on the client side in the sense that uh, you can do certain things on the client side. For example, you can do signal reconnaissance on the client side by sweeping through frequencies, but it always have when you have to reconfigure the radio, uh, you have to go all the way back to the radio here apply modification and then the radio will confirm that the modification has been applied and you go back again to the client and so on and so on so it's really it really takes a long time for this and if you need to sweep fast uh, it might it might not be feasible especially at high frequencies so what we have is something with a uniform interface that can be loaded inside the firmware and can also be configured at runtime so <clears throat> we focus once again on creating um, a, a uniform API that you can develop on. So each of these modules expose an interface based on uh, at least these five methods. One is the after packet received, which receives a packet. So it's a hook that gets called every time um, we receive a packet. Um, sorry, after a packet is received, before um, this hook, so exactly when um, we receive the packet. Um, then there is another hook that is invoked uh, whenever we receive a comment from the user. So when, when the user sends us something, a protobuf message matching a certain signature, um, the module can be configured to react only on certain commands. Then we have the on loop, which is run every time the, the whole firmware makes a loop. And then um, on the initialization. So here you can set configuration parameters. Um, we have implemented um, a series of um, modules already. We have the uh, ping module um, that, of course, is needed to um, find, to discover a, a dongle connected. We have the obligatory hello world module that does absolutely nothing. Uh, but just implement the uh, uniform uh, API. And then we have more interesting modules, such as the frequency scanner that implements frequency sweep. Um, then we have the guessing module, which does uh, pretty smart uh, bit rate recovery. So we try to understand, we try to estimate the bit rate of uh, what we receive on um, certain assumptions, of course. Uh, then we have the, um, the, the mouse jack module. So these are more high level modules. We implement the mouse jack attack. Uh, 
just as a proof of concept to show that it can be done in the module. Then we have the role gen modules and so on. So as long as you honor, as long as you uh, extend from, from the interface that I showed you earlier, you can implement any module you like. And uh, to enable or disable them, uh, there's a nice um, configuration-based system once again. So you might have seen already that um, I had implemented them Sorry, I had enabled them um, in, in the previous configuration. Let's see uh, if they are still enabled. No, I disabled them for this particular build. So I'm going to re-enable them, make flash, and uh, I, I'm going to let it run for a while until it's done and continue with the slides. I'll come back to that later. So just to give you an idea very quickly of how the interface of the modules are, here is the really literally all of the source code that is needed to implement the ping module. Of course, it's a very simple module, uh, but you can see that uh, it is very easy to, um, to understand the meaning of this, of this um, exposed methods. So you have the uh, execute user command that receives certain arguments and the payload that is coming from the client. Then you can decode it as you want. And then we have a series of uh, nice macros that makes you makes it easier to um, to reply to comments. So whenever we have a ping, we will respond with a pong. Uh, that means we call the ping private method. Sorry, the, uh, the the ping method inside the module. We set the reply message to something. In this case, pong. And then everything else will be taken care of by uh, the the method the the module. Um, boilerplate code and here you see that in the console when we ping we, we call the ping module and we call the ping comment which is the only comment that we have we receive the pong message so it's pretty like it's pretty much like a, um, a web api let's say good <clears throat> and here is the bomb the bomb is that there is no client code needed when you develop a model, sorry, when you develop a module, the modules and their methods are automatically discovered by the client. And since we have everything into um, the protobuf messages, the supporting, we can generate the supporting Python code on the fly which means that by doing introspection of one, whatever we receive from the, from, the, from the dongle, we can generate um, classes, um, function signatures, um, uh, type hints, and so on, including a documentation string, um, which is taken from here. I wanna show you an example now. So how, now I have built a, um, firmware with all the modules enabled. I have the frequency guessing modules and so on. So here on the left, I'm going to open a console. <clears throat> so let's take the, the guessing module. Yes, I have all the methods here and frequency help, only frequency, threshold, sampling and so on. And yes, the help contains exactly what's being defined on the client side. Sorry, on the on the dongle side, on the firmware side. So let's take the ping, just to show you. And this comes straight from the description of the type into the firmware. So you don't need to focus on, you don't need to do development on both sides you can just develop on the firmware and 99 percent of that will be unless you have a different um unless you have a different interaction mode or you want to develop a method that cannot be um, invoked by means of calling a function which is very rare um, then everything is already implemented on the on the client side automatically. You don't have to do anything. I think this is a very powerful thing. Good. <clears throat> so now that I showed you um, some 
the existing of some modules, I want to show you uh, the module that I think is the, is the coolest one. Because yes, we have roll jam, we have uh, mouse jack, you can implement um, any other modules that you want with the latest and greatest attacks. Uh, but I think that the, the most interesting thing is having a, um, a module that allows you to uh, play with signals before um, and also responds to message uh, before in, um, um, involving the client at all. So I want to show you an example. So what we have here is, uh, let me open up the camera. What we have here is our trusty IoT node. Uh, this is simulating an IoT node that transmits at uh, 434 megahertz. I'm going to turn this on. This is transmitting a beacon signal. We, we've seen this before, so I'm going to leave it here. And here we have um, an RF quack node. Okay, so uh, you can think of this as a, a simulator of uh, an IoT node that is uh, sending beacons um, in the air. So if we take a look at <clears throat> the terminal here, we have seen it before. Uh, let's connect to it. Okay, so it is sending a string uh, that contains oh ho ho and then a random part. And we have seen before that uh, if we reboot the, um, the firmware, a new, let's say, secret will be um, generated. I don't like all those not all of those nulls, so I'm going to reboot it until it generates something printable. 100%. Sorry, I should probably fix this. This is why you want to do preview demos so you figure out. Okay, <clears throat> I think I like this. Good. <clears throat> so this one is generating uh, another string. And um, we're going to leave it there for a while. So I'm closing the console, but the node is still beaconing. So um, we've seen before that um, if we use RF Quack to intercept packets, <coughs> sorry, to sniff the packets, um, let's put uh, the modem on 434, okay? And then let's put it in um, receiver mode. Let's wait a little bit. Sometimes it, uh, the radio is not uh, really responsive, so I put it in idle mode a few times, and then I put it in receiver mode. Okay, so here we have the packets. Good, so let's now stop for a while. Good, so um, now let, let's suppose that uh, from, from other sources, um, let me turn off the, the camera because it's not needed now. From other sources, we know um, that this target device, this target um, IoT device um, is interactive. Let's say that it's an actuator that, um, um, sorry, it's, it's connected to an actuator that sends beacons, uh, these random beacons, and it only does something if we respond to the device um, in, a, in a proper way. Right, so th th let's suppose that there is some secret way of uh, responding back to these beacons, to these challenges um, that um, our our uh, secret IoT device will accept. So, if we want, and I'm, I made all of this open source, um, we can, you know, um, now we can pretend that we know all of this already, um, just for the purpose of this exercise. Uh, let's suppose that we have recovered the, the source code or we, we know something, well, right? We know how to, how to interact with these nodes, we just have to implement it within the radio. So if we look at the code, um, we see that uh, this very secret function uh, is doing check secret content, um, which uh, is receiving the content and an oracle um, from somewhere. And um, it returns zero only if um, 
the content at the secret position is equal to the oracle at the secret position, XOR a secret, right? So let's pretend that we know this secret for, uh, from other sources and the secret is 33 and the secret position is 10. So we know that, uh, let's see where this function is used. So I'm, di I'm diverting a little, I'm, I'm going, um, um, taking a um, different route here because I want to spend a few seconds uh, talking about this because uh, it's important. So we see that every time we receive, um, we receive a packet, uh, what the radio does is, so here we see that the radio receives uh, so it transmits something and uh, it receives transmits at uh, default frequency we said it's 434 where is it uh, yeah 434 and then uh, the radio tunes uh, at another frequency which is the receiver's frequency 433 and uh, it stays there and waits for receiving something and once it receives something, it compares that something with an oracle. And the oracle is the random string that we, uh, we have captured already. So in this case, it's ohoho, bh, bj, I, uh, ir. And then we know that this, this comparison, this second comparison is checking if the content is equal to the oracle XOR, the secret in secret position. Right, so if we want, and then if that happens, oh, let's see what it does. If that happens, it blinks the, the LED a few times. And um, this can be, let's say, uh, this is a simulating an actuator. Let's say that this is a, a, a door, a smart, lock, a smart lock that opens a door when the, the correct response has been sent, right? In, in practice, things are way more complex than this, but for the purpose of, the, of this exercise, I want to, um, I want to take, keep, this sim uh, keep things simple. Okay, so let's monitor the device. So we see, uh, we see the, the transmissions. So if we want, <clears throat> what we can do is we can take um, the data that we have received uh, let's take the last packet that we have received and um, let's store it somewhere. Uh, let's say TX data is, um, since I cannot alter byte arrays, I will do this. So, um, oops. Okay, so we have the, the data here. Okay. And uh, what we want to do is to alter it. I've already done it here because um, I've tested this to some extent. Um, so we alter the secret. Uh, we alter by a secret in a secret position with a secret content, the tenth byte. Great. So now what we can do is let's use the other radio just for for the sake of it. Uh, radio A set uh, modem config. Let's set it at uh, three, four, three, three, four. No, no, it's four, three, three. I'm sorry. FSK bitrate 4.0. We don't really care about promiscuous mode. Hey, okay, great. So now <clears throat> radio A is in transmission mode uh, and we can do what well, it's not really yet. A um, TX. Okay. So now we can send we can send a message and we can even repeat it 10 times just to, whoops, wrong type. So I need to do eights. Okay, so let's send it 10 times. So we have a chance to, to receive it on the other side. And there we go. We have um, managed to respond in time. Good. So this is all good, but uh, sometimes protocols are faster and they need uh, immediate response or uh, we don't want to script this uh, on the client side. We want to script it into the dongle, but we don't want to modify the firmware. So uh, what we are going to use, uh, let me switch off this monitor because it's kind of annoying. <clears throat> what we use is um, uh, built-in modules, uh, modules called uh, packet repeater. And what it does is that 
you can configure the firmware, the model, the module, I will get this right, the module to repeat through another radio whatever is received on the receiver's radio um, and repeat it a number of times and when you enable it, it will rebroadcast, well not rebroadcast, but uh, resend on whatever frequency, whatever uh, carrier frequency the radio A is configured at, the message that has been received. So uh, I can use this to repeat messages, but I don't want to just repeat messages, I want to change messages before I repeat them. So what I'm going to use is uh, the packet modification engine, which is another module. Let's see the help. I can add modifications and I can enable the model, the module. A modification is um, a way to specify how to change the content. I can change the content at a certain position and I can add several modification rules so I can alter one or more bytes uh, depending on what I need. I can substitute content um, and I can apply operations with another operand and I can filter this and apply this modification only to packets that match a certain regular expression. And on top of this there is also, if you want, the packet filter which is a pre-filter that comes after the filtering happening in hardware, so sync word based filtering for example, before passing uh, data to the packet modification, you can pre-filter and decide whether you want to keep a packet or discard a packet. So if you are in a very noisy environment, you can optimize the firmware to ignore completely everything else that doesn't match a certain pattern. But I'm going to skip the packet filter for now. I'm going to focus on the packet modification. So packet modification uh, has the most important um, method is the add method. So if I check here, um, <clears throat> I see that the documentation string is adds a packet modification rule. Um, of course, there's much more documentation um, on this. I'm going to cheat a little bit and pretend that I already know how to use this. So what I want to do now uh, with this is to add a modification rule that will modify byte at position 10 um, and do XOR operation with operand 33, which is our secret from the other side. So here we have a modification rule added. I can check um, what other modifications rules are there. Now we have only one, um, no filters, no patterns filtering, position 10, content ignore, um, operation 3, which is the XOR, and operand 33. Good. So now I'm going to enable this through I'm going to put radio A in transmission mode. So now every packet that is received is going to be um, modified. I need yet one more repeater. Let's repeat five times and I just need to enable this. Good. And then I put radio B in RX mode. <clears throat> okay, so I received this. Um, what you're seeing here is a bit spurious because uh, B is also, I think this is not really um, done. This is not, this is just a display thing, I think. It's not really done. Um, it's not, it, it seems like uh, Radio B is picking up the replies. Sorry, the repeated, pa the, the repeated packets, but it's not exactly what is happening. I think it's just a, a confusion in, the, in, the, in how data is sent back to the client. Uh, and as a proof of this, we can, we can check um, in the monitor, in the serial monitor of the um, other device. So this device is beaconing out. Let's enable again. And here we go, we see it blinking. I can turn on the camera so you can see the, the LED blinking as well. So it's just... Uh... 
So here we see uh, that when we receive the right packet, um, the built-in LED is blinking several times. And everything is happening on the, on the firmware. I'm not doing anything on the console. I can even disconnect from the console. Um, so RF Quack will keep, keep doing this forever. And you can add more complex uh, modifications as you wish. Good, so um, let's move back to the slides. Um, here is a visual explanation of uh, how filtering and uh, modification happens. So as I said, we can modify on a per um, packet basis. We can filter by pattern, we can do operations. So the generic way to, to express the uh, modification formula is this. And then we can, we can have more rules if the, the, the packet matches a certain um, regex, then it will trigger a rule and you can stack multiple rules one after another. And here is how the, the filtering uh, happens. Here you have on the left hand side um, the radio. So any pre-filter, any filtering happening in the hardware is going to put or drop packets in, in this loop. And then we do another filtering. Then if the rule matches, we put it in the out outbound loop or uh, we can send it to the repeater or to, to, the modification, to the modification rules. Um, before I conclude, I want to remind you that uh, I haven't showed you, but um, the, the console um, the interface that we expose through, um, through Radio Quack allows you to play. Well, actually, I can show you because this is a longer, longer demo, so that's fine. Let's see. Um, RF Quack allows you to um, poke with the radio at a high level as well as a very low level. So you can you can talk to the radio through registers and uh, change register value at every granularity that you want. You can even change just one bit um, through the set and get set register. So you can change, you can pass the address of the um, register, the value of the register, you can get registers back. Let me stop radio B. Okay, so <clears throat> here you can get the address of the of a register and so on. And of course, this opens to uh, several uh, several doors because you can study the data sheet or simply don't study it and try every possible value and see uh, how the hardware reacts. And uh, you could easily hang it, of course. Uh, but that's that's a good thing because probably you have found some corner cases which is uh, good from a from a fuzzing viewpoint. Uh, RF Quack comes with uh, a documentation that has been procrastinated. I procrastinated writing documentation for a long, long time. Um, now I finally found the time to write it down. Um, it's auto-generated, so every um, every change in the source code will auto-generate documentation. Um, we cover uh, getting started, downloading prerequisites in terms of software, how to configure. Everything that we have seen in this demonstration is covered in the, the documentation. Probably this presentation is a little more detailed. So I will, uh, it's a bit work in progress, so I will add more details after this. Uh, there's a paper that uh, uh, myself and Andrea Guglielmini have written uh, last year. Uh, and then there is a source code that I used in this demonstration. So you can replicate all of these, the, the examples that you have seen. There are more advanced um, tutorials on, uh, on the CC1101 using RF Quack with the CC1101 that allows you to do uh, roll jam or uh, mouse jacking if you're interested in those. I wanted to cover more the fundamentals and because everything that you do on top of that is, is just better, but I, I think the power of RF Quack are 
the, the, the fundamentals of the APIs. Um, and now I think is the most, uh, um, the most exciting thing uh, for, for me is to, um, to announce that uh, we have a sort of uh, um, a roadmap for the future, but most importantly, we have prizes for everyone who wants to contribute in terms of uh, pull requests to, um, to the repository. Uh, the ideas that I have for the future um, are the following ones. Uh, Radiolib has uh, support for uh, 11 radios. Radiolib is the underlying um, hardware abstraction uh, on top of, uh, of which RFQuack is built. Um, in RFQuack, we only use three. We have the CC1101, an RF um, Nordic, Semiconduct Nordic Semiconductor RF24, and then we have the uh, RF6069. We really want LoRa, uh, as well as any other, actually. But LoRa is probably the most wanted. Um, I don't really like... <clears throat> I'm going to switch to the camera to show you. I don't really like this. Um, I don't really like the fact that... Um, to decide the wiring, there is uh, soldering needed. Um, so as you can see here, you can decide uh, where to route the um, IRQ and the CR on which pins. So it is somehow uh, flexible because you don't have to reconfigure all of these pins and so on. But still, if you want to swap out this radio and you want to, to connect it to other pins, you will have to uh, desolder and resolder this to other other routes. I really would like to have something um, software based. I know that there are uh, so-called um, cross point switches that allows you to. Um, it's a demuxing operation essentially, and um, it would be nice to have this configurable. Um, URH is a great uh, is a great GUI. Um, and RFQuack has a very open API, so I think there is a good um, marriage here. Uh, there, there is a discussion open on this. I think uh, RFQuack can be used as, um, as another backend for URH. Auto-tuning, which is the frequency and uh, bitrate guessing modules, are implemented only for the CC1101, not because it's the only radio that can do it, uh, it's only because uh, we had to prioritize. So for now, the RF69 and NRF24 are waiting for, for that feature to be ported. And finally, I already anticipated this. I don't like the fact that the data, um, the control data and the login data is mixed in, uh, in, in the transport. Uh, this is not good in terms of performance. In the previous version of RFQuack, um, the serial port was only used for control data. And if you wanted to see logging, you had to connect to other pins. Uh, but this was cumbersome because it was not really portable because I had to carry around uh, another um, UART adapter just to, to see the logging messages. So during development, this is not very handy. Uh, but in production, if you want to like um, to have something that uh, has predictable performance, you don't want to, to put logging into the control data. So the community is waiting for you. Uh, we have a Discord server, so come find us at this link. You have the link to join the server. I will be very happy to see you joining. And uh, here is the announcement for the prize that I'm going to give out. It's a uh, full LoRa, dual radio LoRa kit, 433 and 900 megahertz RF Quack kit based on a ESP32. Of course, the stickers, everyone gets the stickers. To the first person that, yeah, that's my cat. What? Let me finish here. Um, to the first person which will, who will, um, send a pull request containing a testable implementation of a radially based LoRa driver for RFQuack. Um, it must follow RFQuack and radially development guidelines. So I recommend that you check the contributing.md file on both 
repositories and it must come from a legitimate looking github account which means that uh, um, i would not of course uh, do any uh, OSINT on whoever is sending this but um, i want to to some extent make sure that this is not coming from a bogus account um, and the prize uh, i will uh, i will assign it at discretion uh, depending on uh, code quality uh, adherence to uh, the contributing guidelines and so on but i really will i promise i will give out this prize to whoever will com will commit something that will allow the rf crack community to have this important uh, backend implemented of course you're not supposed whoever will send this is not is not expected to test it on a on a lora uh, on a lora kit because we are giving out the lora kit after this uh, but I have the lower kit, so I will um, um, I will do some um, exchanges back and forth, reviewing the code until is is um, is usable, and then depending on the best contribution that I received, I will assign the prize. There are other ways to contribute, um, uh, and um, those will be recognized by um, showing your nickname on the contributors list, and. Um, for example you can um, if you are if you're good at uh, harder development you can develop more um, more shields like this ones you can develop more shields for other radios for example we don't have a, a nice shield for a cc1101 we have nice shields for the uh, rf24 but we don't have nice shields for um, the cc1101 um, we already have the KiCad and Gerbers of existing shields where you can start from. That's all. It was the, this has been a very long presentation. Um, it's the first dry run, so I was expecting this to take much longer. Um, thank you very much for sticking with this, and I hope I will see you live at Blackett in London next week.